Even on official figures, the number of UK deaths reported in the past 24 hours surpasses anything Italy or Spain have experienced. The virus is now increasing the normal daily UK death rate of about 1,600 by more than 50 percent. It's now killed more in a few weeks than flu does in an average year. Of those who've contracted the virus, 8,958 have sadly died, an increase of 980 since yesterday. We never forget that behind this number, behind each one, is a name, a loss, and a family that will never be the same again. These daily figures only give a very partial picture because outside Scotland, they don't take account of people dying outside hospitals, crucially in places like care homes across Britain. The Office of National Statistics figures encompass all deaths everywhere, and they suggest that these daily government stats could be 70 to 80 per cent smaller than the real truth of it. It's very hard to know at this stage, in the middle of a pandemic, just how accurate the numbers we're getting are. And of course, there's a lag between deaths occurring and then being reported and then becoming part of the government's figures. But everybody seems to agree that the numbers coming through of deaths in care homes are hugely underreported. And it's time we did something about that. I think it's an urgent priority for the government to act. For the British public to have no idea how many people are really being killed by this virus every day is frankly a dog's breakfast wherever you stand. Cynics and conspiracists will say it's management by the government of the statistics for political ends. Optimists will say it'll all come right in the end because the ONS figure will give us the true picture one day. So here we are then, the people of Britain locked down, the truth of how many are dying from the virus locked away. It's not just New York, a mass grave prepared in a London Muslim cemetery. Each coffin will be surrounded by earth by Islamic ritual. They say they 50 bodies awaiting burial some for several days. We caught up with Abu Mumin explaining the process in this video. In this very warlike uh, situation, the situation on the ground is pretty bad. A lot of people are dying. A lot of people want to bury their dead as soon as possible. And now the burial ground, there's a waiting list and this is a good solution. 300 miles north and the refrigerated trailers are lining up outside Sunderland's main hospital. The letter from the Coroner City Council and Hospital Trust admits they're concerned about their mortuary filling up. So they're building this to ensure that we have enough safe space to compassionately look after people who pass away and keep them as close to home and family as possible. The letter further confirms that the Ministry of Defence has been called in to ensure the site is as hidden from surrounding houses as it can be. We are working with experts from the Ministry of Defence to ensure that there is both privacy and dignity for the families with loved ones who have died, but also for yourselves as residents who live next door to the hospital site. Please be assured that the structure will be fully covered and as discreet as possible. The MOD rather more obviously at hand here inviting in the cameras to bases where Merlin and Chinooke crews are gearing up to transport NHS patients. Ready, steady, slide. Indeed, four military medevacs for NHS patients have already happened in recent weeks. It's down to the nurses at, at that point to make a decision as to whether, you know, we want to go fast and bumpy or uh, slow and steady. Uh, it's really down to them, uh, depending on the, on the patient's um, condition. The RAF, with experience and lessons learned the hard way from years of medical emergency response teams operating across the fire zones of southern Afghanistan. That knowledge learned so far away is now coming home. Alex Thompson there and we'll be talking to him in a minute. But I'm now joined from East Yorkshire by Dr Anthony Costello, who is Professor of Global Health at University College London and the former director of the World Health Organization. Thanks for coming back on the programme, Anthony Costello. The number today was really very grim indeed, almost a thousand recorded deaths in a day. Does that number surprise you? Well, well, we know that the numbers have been very high and will probably continue to be high until next week. Hopefully by then we will kick in 
and uh, we will have a situation where we start to get this uh, under control with the current lockdown. I'm sure that's working. And I'm sure we're getting um, a suppression of the contagiousness of this virus. Uh, in future, there will have difficult decisions. Are we going to have a cycle of lockdowns and lifts? Or are we going to have to let this, uh, that will have huge economic damage, as you've mentioned. Hmm. Or do we go for a process of slowly releasing it and letting uh, more COVID uh, uh, infections progress and building herd immunity. There have been two new models that have come out, obviously the Oxford one from Sunetra Gupta, but another one from Carl Friston, uh, who has published one, where they think that herd immunity will come up quite sharply. But the evidence isn't there. What we need is to get the uh, data on antibody testing from the Port and Down survey and also from the Germans mm. who have done a huge survey and hope to have the results by early May. Now, there was there is one institute in Washington state in the United States that predicted that the final number of deaths by the end of the summer in this country could be as high as 66,000 and that we will end up being the worst country in Europe when it comes to mortality rates. I mean, is that a far-fetched number as far as you're concerned? It, it's not far-fetched, but I, I think it will be lower than that. But um, we have to face the reality that we, are, we have been behind the curve. I still think lockdown and social distancing will work. The other problem, of course, is if we look to the Asian states, we're finding small flare-ups in Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, even Korea. Now, there's a paper from The Lancet that's just come out from Gabriel Lung from Hong Kong, who looked at the ways in which the Chinese had suppressed the epidemic spreading from Wuhan into their four major cities. And they found that a lockdown, a partial lockdown, worked within about two weeks, but they had to release it very gradually. And now they're having to think about local lockdowns to suppress these. The other country which you've talked about in the past is Korea, mm. which has never had any lockdowns, but they had a massive testing program. Uh, and that seems to have worked, but they are seeing small outbreaks, and particularly with young people who don't want to, you know, they still want to go to bars and clubs and gangnam and places. So, um, there are a number of strategies that we can use, but this is going to run and run unless we get great news about herd immunity. Right, so, so, so to be clear, you think that some form of lockdown, whether it's partially lifted by, you know, by, by industry or by geography, some form of lockdown will continue for the foreseeable future, perhaps months? Well, no, I think for this current period, of lockdown, I would imagine, I mean, I'm completely guessing here, but somewhere between three to six weeks, they may decide to, to lift it. They might do it in a phased manner uh, by lifting it more in the areas where we know, like in East Yorkshire here, there, I don't think there's that many cases, to be honest, in rural areas, though there are in the cities. And so they might prolong the lockdown in city areas. The question then is whether they can build that community protective shield that Korea have mm. by shifting back testing for the virus from hospitals and health workers, which is needed now, but back into the kind of public health method of containing epidemics. And that could give an additional uh, layer of protection. But in order for that to work, in order to manage you know, the easing of the lockdown and actually manage this virus in the foreseeable future, we have to have these tests, not just for whether you've got the disease or not, but also for immunity. Yeah, we do. And, and I mean, if we get good news on it, then we can look forward to a, a, a much quicker resolution of this crisis. But many of us think that that's not going to be the case. We don't know the quality or the, the how long lived the immunity will be. And so we have to, uh, we're playing for time. We're playing for time to get a vaccine which will give us safe herd immunity, but we know that could be 12 months. In the absence of strong herd immunity, we're going to have to box and cox and, and play with a mixture of partial mm. lockdowns from time to time, together with uh, testing of both the immune response, mm. but very importantly, the virus as well. Right. We're playing for time. Anthony Costello, thank you very much indeed. Well, throughout this crisis, we've been talking to frontline workers on the NHS about their concerns, their hopes, their worries, how to tackle COVID-19. Well, we're joined now by Alex again. Alex, uh, you've heard some of these testimonies. What, what can you tell us about them? Yes, of course, health devolved. So what we're going to hear now is from uh, 
be people at the front line with England's uh, COVID wars, but of course it reverberates across uh, the UK. Uh, let's go first off, if we may, to hear from uh, staff at the, uh, the Royal Free Hospital uh, there in London. Um, what one person has said to us, we currently have over 300 positive patients and a further 100 suspected cases in the hospital. There are over 60 positive patients on the ICU intensive care unit, and it is now full. And indeed, they went on. ICU nurses are looking after three to four patients with non-ICU nurses assisting. The patients with COVID-19 are desperately sick. And a further comment from them, uh, the Royal Free, and we've reported on this issue of oxygen pressure, the Royal Free has had to rationalise its use of oxygen for all patients, reducing the targeted blood oxygen saturation to 90, 94%. This is still just about safe, but lower than normal mm. practice. Well, we moved on then to uh, the hospital over in Epsom St. Helier, and their hospital trust, another frontline member told us, the orthopaedic centre based at Epsom Hospital was converted into a new COVID-19 ITU. We've probably tripled ITU capacity and have around 250 suspected or confirmed COVID patients across the trust. And they went on. The turnaround time for testing is still far too slow and takes three to four days. We have situations where patients need to be transferred without rapid testing, and that is a big challenge. And a final comment from this hospital trust. Yesterday morning, there was a trust meeting about how we need to be aware of oxygen usage, that problem again, because we're running at the limit of the available supply. We then moved up to uh, the Midlands, to Derby and Burton Trust, and they've told us We've used up all our ICU-grade ventilators. We're at 30-odd patients, and we could <clears throat> probably scratch together 97 ventilators. So perhaps a bit of spare there, just about. But they say we're down to a nursing ratio of 1 to 2. We are over capacity, but I can put a patient in a bed if I really think they need it. Mm -hmm. And a final comment from them they said, I went down to a weekend on... I went into a weekend on call with one disposable dialysis set for five patients with kidney failure. We've been told by the supplying company that they've all been pulled down to London for the Nightingale units, the vast uh, unit there in the, in the uh, East End. There isn't a structure for resolving that. Well, now, as you'd expect, we put all this to NHS England. Yeah. Uh, they came back saying, uh, basically, and we quote, we're pulling out all the stops to ramp up capacity. I think we've got that already <laughs> in this story. They said, though, that Epsom and St Helier's NHS Trust, they will now be able to offer 24 turnaround on testing for coronavirus out of increased critical, critical care capacity fivefold. Alex, thanks very much indeed. And if you're working on the front line, whether it's in the health service or perhaps as a cleaner, a bus driver, a supermarket shelf stacker, please do get in touch. Our email address is frontlinestories at itn.co.uk. Kathy. Well, at least 20 frontline NHS staff have now died in the fight against COVID-19. As we reported last night, one of them is Abdul Maboud Chowdhury. He had warned the government on social media that NHS staff needed more PPE. Well, I'm joined now by Dr Chowdhury's colleague, consultant urologist Juma Patti, and by his son, Intisar Chowdhury. Intisar Chowdhury, first, I must say, I'm so sorry for your loss and thank you so much for coming with us to this, uh, this very difficult time for you. I read your to my father, father had made this appeal on Facebook um, about the lack of protective equipment for frontline staff. Do you believe in your heart of hearts that the lack of it contributed to him catching coronavirus first and then losing his life to it? So, obviously, I am unable to make a definitive statement about what exactly it was that led to my father catching it, but I, I, can, I can feel it that it was definitely a contrib contributing factor. I mean, it's like you just need common sense to be able to figure that out. But obviously, a hospital worker, a doctor on the front lines in the middle of such a pandemic, not wearing the proper protective equipment, it does not take someone, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that that is going to, that is going to eventually lead to them not being equipped to fight safely, basically. And what did he say to you in the, in the run-up to his death about the lack of this protective equipment for medical staff? I'll tell you now, I, um, so... The post that he made, by the way, I want, I'll, I'll say now, I didn't know about it until yesterday. I found out about it yesterday. I'll say that now. But 
that was because my father, he was in such a state, he was unable to communicate his thoughts, his feelings, his fears to any of us, especially to his children. He was unable to actually tell us about this, this, his fears about the NHS, but that didn't mean that wasn't going to stop him from expressing his fears to the government, to Boris Johnson, telling him what he truly thought and to stand up for his fellow co-workers and colleagues. My dad, he knew he had to do what was right, even though he was in a state of pain. He knew he had to do the right thing and my dad did it. And my dad is right. A lack of PPE is obviously going to lead to unfortunately more deaths of frontline NHS workers. And we need the government to urgently do something about that. It's common sense. And my dad has brought that conversation to light and I'm proud of my father for doing that. It feels like it's a real measure of the man he was that despite the fact that he was in pain, he wanted yeah. to speak out for his colleagues. Tell us about yeah. that. So as in just about my father in general or just like... Um, just what yeah. the kind of man he was. I actually have some, like, I have some tributes that my families, like fam that people that I've known have written. Can I, can I read them out? Am I allowed to do that? Uh, I have them of right course here you just can. Yes, of course. to talk about my father. So this is this one is from Dr. Farukul Islam, Zinatul Islam, Renu Muslim, Sadia Islam. They talked about how these are our neighbors, by the way. They knew my dad so well. They talked about how devastated they were to hear about their dearest neighbor, friend, and brother, how he was a great man that always thought about others, his charity hospital in Bangladesh that I want to speak about in a bit, how his family meant the world to him, how his whole community has been left broken. And, and they also mentioned how they do pray for the Prime Minister's health, health, but want the Prime Minister to take my father's words and not let his passing in vain. And I also want to read something on behalf of my cousins and just my the, the blood relatives of my father. So this is Zawad, from Zawad Hussain, Barastar Munra Hussain, Lina Begum, Tasfiyah Tazli, Nibras Begum, Ibn Rashid, Shaheen Akhtar, and Mir Rashid Ahmed. Basically, so I'm sorry to just list all the names, but I, they need, their names need to be heard. We're all... To, they were all carrying on the legacy of my father. They're talking about how he was an incredible role model, an inspirational figure. He dedicated, he committed, de sorry, he committed decades of his life to helping and saving people <clears throat> whilst working as this consultant urologi urological surgeon. He donated so many charities, treated poor patients in Bangladesh. And my cousin said that if there's one piece of wisdom that he's gained from him, it is that life really is too short to live ordinarily and that we should live it to our best abilities. My dad really was larger than life, and I just, I love that about him. I, I think, I mean, he sounds a truly remarkable man, and thank you so much for sharing those thoughts with us. Let me just <coughs> turn to Jim Apati now. Clearly, yeah. the loss of your colleague has been felt really keenly by uh, hospital staff. Yes, um, after he passed, uh, at about five o'clock in the morning, I sat down and wrote an email to all the hospital staff. Uh, and um, within a few hours, uh, my inbox was flooded with tributes from all the different people that work in the hospital, including um, phlebotomy department, uh, microbiology. I mean, our own department was obviously devastated to hear but there were people from the wards, the theatre staff, um, from all different areas, not only of the hospital, but also from uh, people who had worked in the hospital with him back in 2008. I had a, a consultant now, but she used to be a, a junior doctor when she uh, was training, when Abdul was a registrar there uh, with us. And actually it's Homerton Hospital that he, he works at, not Queen's. Um, so Yes, absolutely. We made a mistake in the intro. Thank you for correcting that. Just a tribute to him that after so many years, people have, who have only met him probably for a month or two, can still remember vividly how he was. And everybody pretty much remembers his smile. And you could feel the warmth in his heart. And I had the privilege of being... He used to call me his mentor, so that was a privilege for me. And now it's an honor for me to be able to speak about him. Although extremely sad that Thank I have to speak about him this way. Of course, completely Sorry. understand. But thank you for coming and sharing this with us. Do you think when you look back at the fact that he did raise the alarm about the lack of protective equipment, do you think that his death was potentially preventable? I don't think his 
particular problem was related to lack of PPEs as far as I am aware. He became unwell with mild fevers and, uh, and we were all sort of developing flu at this time. And he had actually taken two weeks off because of feeling like he was getting a bit of flu. But um, his concern was really about his co-workers, not in the urology department particularly, but people who he used to meet when in intensive care or on the wards who were much more frontline than our department. And he was really talking about sort of a voice for them because they were busy at work. And he could see that people who were in that position who were having to deal with it, not just in our hospital, I think he was talking about the NHS broadly at that early stage, and now that has been corrected, but in that early stage, um, he felt like there wasn't enough done. And I don't think he was talking about himself at all. And I'm not sure if that even contributed to his, uh, you know, uh, illness. But he was, as always, really talking about talking about some, you know, other people. Intersar Chowdhury, you shared those amazing tributes to your father. What? When was your last conversation with him? What did he say to you? So the last interaction was different from my last conversation because the last time I spoke to him was in hospital. He was unconscious. He wasn't able to respond, obviously. But the last conversation I had with him, if I just think, like, obviously during him being ill, he wasn't able to communicate that much of me. But I'm just, if I do try to remember the last thing he said, one of the last things he said was, um, I had come home from school and I was talking about how um, I had tried to high five a friend in school and they would they use their elbow instead to like to you know show a gesture of friendship and I was telling my dad that's so ridiculous like why won't my friend high five me and my dad was like no your friend is right this is serious this is dangerous you need to you need to follow protocol you need to so you need to stay a safe distance away from everyone and my dad on that day my dad literally explained the gravity of the whole situation but I myself couldn't understand at that time of the pandemic. And just in general, my father, he was just such an amazing, compassionate man, as in how much time do I have to actually talk about him? Because I, I would just talk about him for hours if I could. He genuinely was, he loved everyone. He loved his, sorry, did you want to, uh, he, yeah, he loved his, um, yeah, continue, sorry, you know. Uh, in, into Sarge Chowdhury, I, I would love to carry on talking about this. Your father sounds like an incredible person. Thank you so much for coming on the programme. We unfortunately don't have any more time, but thank no, you. Right. And thank you, Juma right. Patti, too. Thank can I just thank say you. one more thing quickly? And as remember Dr. his name, Patti. Dr. Abul Mahbub Chowdhury. Dr. Abul Mahbub Chowdhury, rem thank remember you, his name. He is a hero of our generation. Do not let anyone forget his name. Thank you and so let his, much. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. You've paid an amazing tribute to him tonight. Thank you so much. And as Dr. Patty made clear, Dr. Abdul Mahbub Chowdhury was a senior consultant in the urology department at Homerton University Hospital, not Queen's Hospital in Romford, which is where he died.